Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. I am here today with actor Neil Jackson, who's come to us all the way from Vancouver, Canada. Neil, what's going on, my friend? How are you, dude? It's, it's good to see you. I, how long has it been? When when was that? For, you know, we, we did we did a. I, I got contacted by a Portuguese company. Yep. This has got to be. 10, 12 years ago? It was uh, 11 years. It was 2009. It was Thanksgiving yeah. week. 2009, so 12 years. It 12 was years. Monday through Wednesday. 11 and a half years ago. Yeah. Damn. Yeah, it was an amazing Portuguese company called the Secor Brothers, who are a sort of men's clothing outlet uh, company yep. that asked uh, me, and I forget the girl's name, we'd both been in um, Quantum of Solace. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, um, the tall girl. Uh, yeah, tall girl. Yeah. Shoot. Amazing. Uh, Andy, not Andy McDowell, but uh, McDowell's her last name. Oh, okay. Well, oh. good memory for you. I, yeah, I can't remember. And apologies to uh, her. Yeah, uh, she it's was taller than both of us, I think. <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm you played... to remember what I've had for breakfast these days. So. I want to hear you. Well, you played Slate in Quantum of Souls. She was a flight attendant. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. So, what, both... okay, so you, you came all the way. I saw you were in, um, what, North west of england or london rather about an hour north or so luton is that what it's called yeah like 20 minutes north luton um luton is best way to describe it to an american is luton's kind of the detroit of the uk it was built on the uh, car manufacturing um industry um in the 60s 70s early 80s and then mid 80s they started selling off um the car plants to europe so um, mgm and Vauxhall left and suddenly luton which was a, a flourishing working class city ended up becoming um a little rougher because there was there wasn't the work there there was massive unemployment disenfranchisement all of this kind of stuff and then really sadly in the around the same time mid 80s as there was a lot of people coming over from um, India, Pakistan, Middle East, um, old uh, colonial enclaves that um, were emigrating over um, and they were looking for housing and the government put them in Luton, which is great. But the problem was it created this huge race divide. We had, we had um, all of the disenfranchised, you know, blue collar workers in the UK, who suddenly were out of work and struggling to find work. And then there was a load of uh, Muslim uh, Somali um, uh, people coming in who were getting housing benefits and um, That's rough. extra kind of welfare equivalent that um, weren't being given to the out of work Brits. And it's no fault on anybody's part, but it started to create this clash. And I left there when I was seven years old, seven and a half years old, uh, Luton, and um, just as Luton was getting really rough, really, really, pro I was having problems in school, I've been suspended, there was a lot of fights and stuff going on at that age, and gangs were kind of starting to come into um, uh, Luton, so uh, my parents wanted to move to a safer area, so we moved 10 miles out to a place called Barton de Clay, which is a beautiful little hamlet village, 10 miles out, which weirdly enough then became a heroin den, Oh wow! Uh, just, the drugs kind of moved their way over into this little area just as I was moving out of there when I was 18, moving to university. Um, but Luton, Luton's a great place. It's, I haven't been back there in... Actually, the last time I was there was probably about a decade ago. My brother was a professional boxer and uh, he had a fight in Luton. And um, it was an eye-opener for me. I turned up there uh, with my family to go and watch my brother's fight, and it was it was like a pikey car park. I, I, I love Luton, but it was just guys with mullets and dogs on rope, you know, that kind of a place. And it was like, oh, yeah, this, Luton's, Luton became rough. And I'm, I'm, I've heard they're gentrifying it now, so if there's anybody from Luton, I'm not shitting on Luton. I, I, I love the place. It's my hometown. but uh, I know what you mean. It sounds like the Detroit of... Yeah, oh it's God. kind of got that. Yeah, when I when I heard, I had a friend of mine from Detroit, and he was explaining. I was like, "Dude, that's that's exactly the same as us." It was kind of like car manufacturers, plants left. Everyone was kind of scrubbling and, and trying to figure things out for themselves with the whole the vacuum that was left from the car industry. Right. So yeah, that was where that was where I grew up, um, up until eighteen, and then I moved to Cardiff for five years for university. I did an undergraduate in sports science and a master degree in sports science. Wow. And then I finally figured out that I wanted to be an actor, moved to London and enrolled in an acting course and then lived in London for seven years. So all so this time kind of doing the sports science went nowhere then. <laughs> yeah, it was just, it was one of those things of just like, 
I don't know how it, it was with you. I don't know how it is in the States. In Britain, at least when I was a kid, and I think it's even more so now, you know, it was drummed into us, qualification, qualification, qualification. You've got to get your GCSEs, which is up to 16. You've got to get your A-levels, which is 16 to 18. And then you go and get a degree. And it almost doesn't matter what degree you get. Just get a degree because all people care about is that you've got a university qualification. And I remember being 17 and I was, I was doing school plays and really enjoying being in school plays and the fun, the lark of being an actor. And um, I, I went to careers advice. Everybody in my year had to go to a careers advice specialist. And I went to her and um, I said, I want to be an actor. And she literally laughed at me and said, OK, let's figure out what a decent job would be. And we decided, my, my older brother is a fighter pilot in the Royal Air Force. Oh, wow. I had a friend who was in the army. So I went, I'll be a Royal Marine. I'll go and join the Marines and that'll be me, a life on the ocean waves. So um, I went to Limpston uh, in uh, the southwest of the UK to the Marines base to do a potential officers course, this thing called POC. And it's a weekend, three day course, um, all physical. And uh, I failed the course, but they said, we really liked you. Um, go and get a degree, come back when you're 21. You're a little young now and we'd love to keep you on record. So the only reason I went to university was to get this degree so that I can then go on and become a Royal Marine. Right. And so sports was the easiest thing. I was always into sports and fight sports and things. So I applied to eight universities and the first one that gave me an offer was Cardiff. So I went to Cardiff in Wales to um, study sports. And I, I was probably six weeks into my course and I was like, what the fuck do I want to be a Royal Marine for? Right. right. <laughs> it was something like the idea of being woken up at 4 a.m. to do press ups in the mud by some hairy oik didn't seem particularly appealing. But now I'm doing this course. So I'm doing the course and I was a boxer. I was boxing. So you um, and your brother boxed also? Yeah, my, my, I, I boxed as an amateur and then my brother went on and took it on as a professional. Gotcha. Um, so I was boxing as an amateur and uh, I was nearing the end of my degree, didn't know what I wanted to do. And the Dean of the college spoke to me and they'd never had a boxer in their college before. It was a sports university. And right. they, they had a, a whole plethora of different sports. But big rugby was a big one because it's Wales. Um, he said, we've never had a boxer here and I'd won a British title for them. And he said, uh, we'd love to give you a scholarship. Would you be interested in doing a master's degree and staying on at the university? Um, and I was like, yeah, I didn't know what I was going to do. So he said, we'll give you a scholarship to stay on. And I was cheeky. He said, uh, we'll give you a year scholarship to do a, a, a master's degree in a year. And then I said, I can't do the master's degree in one year. It's, you know, I need to be out of work as well. Right. And uh, he said, okay, we'll give you the scholarship for a two year degree. I was like, okay, great. And then I went back and I went, you know what, I don't think I can do it because I need to be able to pay my way and I need to be able to work and it's going to be hard doing it. And he said, okay, well, we'll give you, I think it was 200 pounds a week to help out with rents. You don't have to work so much right, so right. that you can concentrate on your studies, which was mind blowing. Yeah. It was the equivalent of you here in the States, these sports scholarships that kids get. And so I was like, all right, the next two years are taken care of for me to figure out what I want to do. And, um, Halfway through the year, we had this thing, Sports Personality of the Year Awards. So, because um, it was all the plethora of sports, I was nominated that year for boxing. And then after the ceremony in the university, we all sat around drinking. You know, a collection of like 20, 30 of us sat around drinking. And there was a guy called Bob Teague, who was a physio, with big sausage fingers, who would play the piano. <laughs> and uh, I, he, uh, he started playing Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me. And right. I took the mic, I said, I'll sing this one. So I started singing, Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me. And I didn't realize, but the dean of the Welsh College of Music and Drama was there. And she heard me singing. And afterwards she said, have you ever thought about a career in, in music, in musical theater, anything else like that? And I said, I'd, I'd love to be an actor. I don't know how to get into it. I don't know what to do. And she said, next week we've got open tryouts at the university. If you want to come along and have an open tryout, uh, we'd love to see if you have what it takes to join the course. And I was like, well, great. I'll happily jump ship from my sports science degree and go and pursue acting. Right. And I got a monologue and don't let the sun go down on me. I've got the sheet music for that, ready to give the pianist. And I turned up there and there was a panel of maybe three or four people. 
And I started doing the monologue and they stopped me less than a minute in and said, you clearly don't have any training. We don't think that you've got a future as an actor. Oh. I didn't even get to the song. And so I walked out of there and the fighter in me was like, all right, we'll see about this. So I contacted a friend and said, let's write a play together. I'll raise the money, Just purely naively. I'll raise the money. I'll put the play on in the fringes in the West End in London. Agents will come and see it. They'll obviously fall in love with me and I'll become an actor and that'll be the way things go. The play became a musical. The musical ended up, it was hilarious. I, I, I would work, I was working as a bouncer in some clubs to make money. I was boxing uh, five days a week, fighting probably once every three or four weeks. And then every other weekend I would uh, drive to London to work with my friend who's a musician working on the music for it. But I'd be on the door, I'd be standing on the door in these rough clubs in Cardiff with a dictaphone in my pocket because I'd suddenly come up with an idea for a song for my musical and I'd be like, and then put the dictaphone down, but sorry, mate, you can't come in. Um, <laughs> and uh, the musical thankfully came third that year in a competition for unsolicited musicals for unsigned writers. A producer heard about it. He asked for a prepared read through. I decided to move to London by that point, finished my master's degree in a year to get it all done, moved to London, got six undergraduate actors and myself and my friend with a piano uh, in a church hall and spent the night making crappy sandwiches to try to impress this producer. We did the prepared read through of my musical, which was a boxing musical called Ringside. Right. And uh, afterwards, uh, that was a Friday. On the Monday, he called me into his office and he said, look, the musical's good, but it needs work, which it obviously would. I'd never written anything before. He said, why did you write it? I said, I wrote it to get into acting. And he said, well, I have my own acting school. And he used to be a teacher at RADA, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts. And um, he taught at several other of the prestigious schools, Mountview and various places, and then started his own course maybe 20 years before that. And he gave me a scholarship to his course. Um, so a two year part-time course. So I worked as a personal trainer, five days, uh, three days a week worked in his production company two days a week and then every Sunday for eight hours did his acting course and graduated graduated that 21 years ago mate so you had scholarship 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 you had like an idea of where you wanted to go with your life you changed to you go to this no never mind I'll change it you wanted to be an actor but then they stab you in the heart and say you're not good enough and then you mm -hmm. do your own thing and the guy's like, well, it's okay, but it needs work. What'd you do it for? I want to be an actor. Well, guess what I do for a living? I mean, it's just like, yeah. it's like all the lights were coming on for you. It's, I, I don't know how it is with you. I, I'm, I'm not a religious person. I right. don't believe in God. Uh, I don't believe in the sort of secular idea of heaven and hell. I have a sort of belief, call it the universe, call it whatever you want to call it. I think and it's very sketchy. This is where my ideas get a bit woo-woo. I have found when I align myself to what I really feel I should be doing and I move other things aside and put myself on that path, it's amazing how I can't, I can't see what the next few steps are. Oh, sorry, the, the, the multiple steps. I can see what the next couple of steps are. And as long as I keep making those steps, it's like headlights on a, a, on a night road. Right, you know, right. the, the next bit of road always seems to illuminate. Right. And it's like, oh no, I'm going in the right direction. And if, if that piece of road doesn't illuminate, I'm like, oh, well, clearly I'm not on the right path because the next step hasn't illuminated as I'm going along. And the moment I went, yeah, I think acting's the right path. And obviously I had to put work in and I wrote the musical and I submitted it and I, 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 I put myself into this course and then after the course I spent six months touring with a production of a play for free because I was understudying an actor so kind of did my probation work kind of thing for it but it's like the, the road the next few steps of the road just kept lighting up for me I was like okay this is where I'm going all right this is where I'm going oh this is where I'm going and it was it, I've always believed that I kind of feel like as long as as long as I am active and actively pursuing sure. this thing that I want. Yeah. It's like, I, there's a Tchaikovsky quote, which I always loved. And it, and it said, inspiration exists, but it needs to find you working. Right. And I always loved that idea of, 
sitting and waiting for inspiration, anybody can do that. And maybe lightning will strike. But I find that when I start taking steps, then the inspiration that shows itself and the path starts to unfold for me. You have to make effort. Yeah. And yeah. I, I was just, so, dude, I was just so, I, I consider myself so lucky. But at the same point, I was very active towards making that luck happen. So I made sure that I was in the right environment. So if the luck hit, I was able to go within the direction that it took me. Yeah. And I kind of think, I kind of think that, I mean, you know yourself, I kind of think that that's what it is. A life in the arts is, I view it like being a professional athlete and having been a, a fairly high level athlete myself, you know that if you've done your road work as a boxer, if I've done my bag work, if I've kept my flexibility up, my strength work up, my skills, my training, my sparring, if all of that's good, I'm ready when the opportunity comes. And as long as I am prepared, the opportunity will come and I will be able to make the most of it. Whether I succeed or fail, I've made the most of the opportunity. The worst situation is for an opportunity to arise and you're not in fighting shape. Yeah. You're not ready to go. And you never, it means you, you're never going to stand a fair chance, a fair shake at it. And I felt that that was the way. So I approached my acting career like an athlete. I was like, okay, what do I need to do to get all of my ducks in a row so that whenever the opportunity arises, I'm like, okay, I'm going here, I'm going here, I'm going here. And for a long while, for a long while, I felt like the De Niro character in Heat. I don't know if you remember. There's a great oh, yeah. speech. There's a great speech that he says to the woman. He, he, he was like, paraphrasing it, but don't. Don't you, you need the kind of life that you can pack up in 15 minutes. Don't ever have any attachments that you aren't willing to say goodbye to within 15 minutes. Because if you suddenly get that call, you got to go. And yeah. He's talking about if the police find him or whatever. But I kind of felt like that for the last five, for the first five, eight years of my career. It was like, I, I'm ready to go. Put me in, coach. You, you, want me to, you want me to do a movie in Abu Dhabi? All right, I'm, I'm, I'm going there. You want, you, you want me to do a touring production of a play? All right, I'm there. I just, I, I wanted to make sure that all my roads were open so I can just go whenever I needed to go. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a weird, wonderful little journey. So you mentioned a quote earlier. I always, I don't know if you know who Dr. Wayne Dyer is or was, he passed uh -huh. away. If you look him up, Dr. Wayne Dyer, he's got over, I want to say close to 30 books. He does a lot of PBS show. He did a lot of PBS shows and his stuff is fabulous. Yeah, right. can, yeah. If you look up Dr. Wayne Dyer, one of his shows on YouTube, you can watch it. It's called the power of intention and the stories he reads, he, he reads from his own books sometimes while he's on stage. But one of the things he quotes, there's two of them. And I love this one. I use this a lot is when you have a problem in your life, whatever it could be, it could be financial relationship or just a, a stump in the road, you know, and he always said, when you change the way you look at something, what you look at changes. And I was always like, damn, like as simple as that sounds, it's like it's like you you turn it around from like, like, oh shit, like how in the hell am I gonna do this now? I, I can't do it. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Change the way I'm looking at it. You know, like you said about the, how the headlights come on step by step by step. And it's like those little things that you have to do to be ready for it. You know, it's like, so if you change the way you look at something, instead of looking at like a big obstacle, look at like a challenge, like instead of an obstacle, because it's more likely you put it there to begin with. And then the other quote he always said is you become your surroundings. Mm -hmm. So look at what you're surrounding yourself with, including people, you know, yeah. and I tell yeah, a lot of very people, much people, I think yeah. people almost more importantly than anything else, people, because if you're around, LA was, I, I moved out of LA two years ago and live in Vancouver. Now, which is the beginning of this. I love LA. LA is a, an amazing place. It's been a, a wonderful um, learning ground for me. And it's been very fruitful for my career. LA at its core is a very competitive place. It's the Mecca for the film industry. And maybe that's going to gradually change as the world kind of opens up. London's becoming very hot. Vancouver's becoming very hot. But for the next foreseeable future, it's the Mecca. And people from all over the world travel to that Mecca in order to test their skills to see if they have what it takes to become whatever their goal is. And so it's the largest melting pot for the most competitive industry in the world. Yeah. And everybody there is hustling everybody there that I've met, that I've experienced, and I lived there for 16 years, is hustling. You know, waking up that day and going, all right, how do I move the needle? Because I didn't 
for me in particular, I didn't leave my friends and my family in London to come to LA to just laze out by the pool right. and just drink my ties. That's nice on occasions. I came there to hustle and get my career going. And most of the people that I've met from there are doing this constantly, constantly, which is super invigorating. But also I found that it depleted me gradually over the years because that level of competition, that level of heightened hustle, the constant, you know, like you, I notice it now, you go to LA and you ask somebody, how are you? The first answer that they'll give is how is your, you know, they perceive the question as being, how is your career going? How are you? I've had a couple of auditions, some good things in the pipeline. The you yourself, how are you, gets very lost right. within the, the, the work and the sort of idealization of career. And I noticed that my value system became, if not 100%, 95% about my career. I was going to the gym so that I could look in the right shape so that I'm ready, put me in coach. Right. If there's a role that is required for me to be a physical shape or to take my top off, I would go to certain parties because I knew there's an opportunity to meet somebody there and I might network. I would go to certain restaurants, certain places because it's places that you can bump into people. And I started thinking very much about what's the thing that helps my career? What's the thing that helps my career? And that life-work balance was work-life balance. And one of the reasons I made the decision that I wanted to leave is because it just didn't serve me anymore. I wanted to be around people who are really enjoying their life, enjoying the way that they're living. And their career, whilst passionate, isn't the 95% of their entire value system. It's a more balanced place, which is why moving to somewhere like Vancouver, well, Vancouver in particular, has been so key for me because even though there's been a pandemic, is that your pup? Ah, oh, cough it up, little buddy. What's it? Him? Her? She's got a uh, collapsed trachea. Oh, bless so every, her. Every once in a while it kicks up and she'll, uh, uh, and. Oh, bless her socks. And her, her sister's a great dame. <laughs> <laughs> not biological i'm imagining not no i always say they're I always say they're twins but their mother wasn't crack <laughs> yeah yeah right she she uh she had a wide spectrum of type <laughs> oh uh oh speaking of which look at this there she is oh there she Stella. is come here come here it's a beautiful five. painting did you paint that what's that did you paint that oh no that's, i took it oh it's a, it's a photo is it yeah I, I blew it up it's so the the one on the bottom, she's wrapped up in leaves. I would take it over closer. I got my microphone wired to the computer. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, here, I actually I can move it closer to you. It's, uh, I had a thing called Urban Ballet. I love that. It's beautiful. And, and wow. We're actually on the way to a uh, to an alleyway, and, th and this is a cobblestone road, and all these leaves had just fallen. I went, <laughs> we have got to use this. So she did about 11 purelettes until we finally got just the right shot. Yeah, oh, that's gorgeous, dude. Right. A great and picture. The one above it, if you can see, I'll get that off the wall real quick. Yeah, she's doing, and, and that's on a railing. Wow, the balance. I helped her up on the wall. It's actually she's on a stairwell. So you can, see she's on a stairwell. That's incredible. I helped. I pushed her hips up real fast. I ran backwards, got my wide angle, and just yeah. started shooting. And that's one of the shots I got of it. And then the other one, as simple as it looks. It's not that simple to do. I've seen her. We did a few tries. She's on her toes, but all her balance is dead center of her where her knees are at. Yeah. So if she doesn't do it right, she'll teeter totter one way or the other. Uh, I really know you're your beautiful. Point. I mean, the way that you've captured movement and all of them—they're really stunning, mate. Thank you. I, you know what? So you know, I I met John Russo, who you and I—that's how you and I met through John shooting at Santa Barbara Polo Club. Mm -hmm. And but so oh Rachel McDowell that was her name Rachel McDowell yeah well well done yeah 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 it just, it just hit me and you remember the hotel that we stayed in the Montecito Inn yeah did you know they got demolished in the mudslides I didn't know that the whole thing got demolished I had no clue I saw it on the news oh, and they said the Montecito and doing a little tour around there because the Montecito Inn was where Chaplin stayed they had the um, they they had a couple of plaques around yeah um, the, the the Chaplin. Either Chaplin had a permanent room there or um, he used to use it for meetings or something. So the level of history goes back to, you know, filmic history, Hollywood history is over a century old. Right. 
But yeah, so I remember the rooms. I, I was I was always fascinated by the. I don't know why I always loved the Montecito Inn because it's different from other places. Because they had you actually had a brass key. Every yeah. room was decorated differently than the one next door to it. The food was fabulous. The you know we had that little crude get together each yeah. night. We were there what two nights, three days, wasn't it? I think it was two nights. Yeah, two nights three days. Yeah, two nights. I yeah. remember the last. I remember the last night. Blessing the producers. Uh, I think you were there. We were having a meal and. Um, the producers came down and said, oh, this, this meal's on us. And, and they said, have you tried the dessert? Um, uh, the desserts here? And I was like, no, let's try the desserts. So we got one of every single one of the desserts. Um, we tried them. It was, it was decadent. Oh, yeah, my God. The food there was spectacular. Was I'm, a, I'm a reformed sugar junkie. I used to be so, so addicted to sugar. And um, it was about eight years ago now. So a couple of years after we did the shoot together, um, I... Uh, I finally had some things with my health go wrong and cut refined sugar out and instantly felt a million times better. I always had um, hyperglycemia, um, which was a thing that I was fighting with and I used to get hangry. Yeah. Um, if I didn't eat every three, four hours, I would get hangry. And so it was always this thing of ex-girlfriends or friends would just be like, yeah, do you need a snack? Because <laughs> And suddenly, I, uh, I got rid of sugar and uh, none of that ever bothered me again. But that dessert, <laughs> just going through the 10 different desserts options, back then was just, that was my crack. I was like, oh, oh my God. I, I couldn't live without chocolate. I still binge. I don't binge. Every once in a while, I do, definitely do. Like, like you're drinking your coffee. I have okay. my, I, my English breakfast tea. Oh, but I have tea. Okay. I have coffee. I have about two to three a day. And I, I've not had a soda or a coke nothing like that in almost six years oh, wow. i don't eat fast food uh i had an rv sandwich every once in a while but is that really fast food you know but that's about it other than that i drink water and coffee and yeah. i don't drink alcohol i don't smoke don't do drugs and oh. i just do photography and i'm starting my magazine coming up and it's all i'm excited about doing all that so but what i was going to tell you about the whole john russo thing is he's kind of what inspired me to get into photography after doing the modeling okay. things and I see who he shoots and what he did. And I always, he's always talked to me about when I was wanting to come to LA to be like a model or actor or whatever, sort of out there. And he was going to try to give me a little roadmap and help me out. Because he, the guy's got connections and a half. Mm -hmm. And back then I did fitness training. This is, this is before I even met you, about three years before I met you. Right. And he just says, well, then come, you just need to come to LA and do it. I said, yeah, but you know what I need to do? And this is just a little story. He, he kind of inspired me a little bit. Cause he came from Jersey, a small town in Jersey and became this big celebrity photographer now. Mm -hmm. So he had mentioned, I had told him, I, you know, I do fitness training. He says, well, come out to LA and just tell everybody you're the guru of fitness training. And I was like, uh, yeah, but I'm not. So how am I going to just say that? He just says, you just say that you are kind of like how you put it out there to the universe. Like mm -hmm. you live it, like you already have it. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I've been doing with this business I started, I've been doing photography for almost 12 years now, right about, well, not 12 years, but since 2013. So I'm not quite, yeah. Um, when I got into doing that and learned more about the, the photography, the magazines, and John would always kind of reach back out to me and say, hey, here's what I would probably do, you know, and just, you start honing, honing your craft a little bit here and there. But everything yeah. I've been doing, just like you said, lights keep lighting up every time I, I plan on doing something, I, it always happens for me. So I believe what you're saying about all that. Great. I mean, it's like just looking at your art there, and I've seen some of your art online. I've seen some of the pictures that you, you put up and stuff like that. One of the biggest things for me, which has been the development really over the last four years or so, because I'm now twenty in my 21st year of, of, of being an actor. And in the last four years, I've started to understand what my voice is. I kind of think, whether you're an interpretive artist or you're a creative artist, because I think that there's, there's two types of artists. One interprets, an actor interprets a script, a musician interprets a score, and then there's creative artists that are creating something from nothing, a writer, a sculptor, um, a photographer, um, is, is, is creating what they see and trying to capture it you need to have a voice, right? You right. need to know what the thing that you're trying to say because it's a communicative medium. And if you don't know what you're trying to say, if you don't know what the message is that you're trying to communicate, and that can be as simple as just fun and pleasure, or it can be all the way through to whatever your message is. If you don't know what your voice is, 
and this is the thing I struggled with for a long time in LA. I didn't know what my voice is. All I wanted to be was successful. Yeah. And so I was bouncing around looking for this external validation of what's the thing that's going to make me successful is being in this show is being in this show is being in this party is it is, is training in this gym what's the thing that's going to give me that edge that's going to make me successful and getting a little older now and having done this for a long while and 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 had a wonderful career that i'm very grateful for and been on huge sets and small sets and traveled around the world doing it i started to look at what's my perspective what is my perspective of the world and what is the thing that i want to say through my work right not just as an actor but as a writer and as a director as well and a musician i, I dabbled in music uh, for a little bit and still have a guitar with me what's the thing that i want to say and i think like just the three photos that you just showed me there i instantly get a voice from you I instantly get a sense of this is this is who you are as an artist. There's beauty and movement and and the there's an energy to it that engages me and fascinates my eye. And that's just from the three photos. So it seems that like the world you is. found your voice through photo through photos and through vi visual art. And it's it's such an important thing, such an important thing to discover that. And I feel so very lucky that. I'm now on the path to discovering that. It's not just, I just want to act. Yeah. I just want to write. It's no, no, I want to, I want to act th in these kind of projects and I'm writing these kind of projects. This is my voice. Um, and I'm starting to get to express that in a way that feels authentic. People are hearing it. What, so what was your like aha moment when you're you're talking about you I gotta be in this movie I gotta be in that movie to feel success like what was it like what particular set or the, the, the biggest biggest aha moment for me I think would have been just after my 40th birthday living in Los Angeles I just um, ended a relationship 10 and a half year relationship um, and completely amicable but we decided to break up I was flat broke I had 300 dollars in my bank account and 25, 26 grand worth of debt. And suddenly just went, how the hell am I here? You know, the plan I had when I was 23, when I enrolled in the acting course to become an actor. Um, if somebody had said at the age of 40, 15 years later, uh, say 17 years later, I would be in LA, but I would be broke. And I would be, um, I hadn't worked for a year. I'd done a couple of things, like one day on a movie and one day on a movie. So on my CV, it looked like I was staying busy. Right. But as you know, one day on a movie gets a, a SAG day rate. And once your agents and everybody take a piece of pie of that, you get kind of $350, $400 as a day rate, which of course is lovely money as a day rate if you're working every single day. Right, right. I did a couple of them in that year, which meant that I was eating into savings. Savings were gone, credit card debt, everything else like that. And I finally started driving Uber. I was like, okay, I need to, I need to earn to make a living. And it was a real ego wake up call for me. Um, I'm like, I've been in Bond movies and uh, I've, I've been the star of TV shows. And I've, I've done stuff that I would look at my resume if I was 23 and be like, this guy is successful. And yet here I am broke with debt and can't afford rent and uh, starting to drive Uber. And um, I had to get rid of the place that me and my girlfriend, my ex-girlfriend had. And I couldn't, I couldn't afford, as I said, I had $300 in massive credit card debt, massive credit card debt based upon what I was earning and, and, and everything. And uh, thankfully two friends of mine um, agreed to put me up uh, in their place, but it was driving Uber and being humbled. I, I needed to be humbled. And the thing that I realized was I felt that I was too good to do that. I, I pedestaled myself. My ego had pedestaled myself uh, to say that I'm this actor who's been in these movies and I've been on red carpets and, you know, I've had all of the sort of trappings that come from that. And here I am broke. I'm too good to drive Uber. I'm too good to do this menial job. And when I realized that that was the, the, the sort of recording that was happening in the back of my head, my reptilian brain just going, I'm too good for this. My ego just going, dude, what are you doing? No, don't do this. 
it sickened me. It was like, fuck, I'm not, who the fuck do I think I am? I'm too good to drive Uber. It's an honest job. I get to honest money. And I had the most amazing first ride. My first Uber ride. If, if you'd have written this down, people wouldn't believe that this was a movie script. Like there, there, there were three things that scared the shit out of me about driving Uber, all ego based. Right. The first one was my ego wouldn't be able to handle it, that um, I've stooped to this level and my career has uh, crumbled to the level that I'm driving a taxi. The second one was I was worried if I drove somebody that I personally knew, because then I would have to admit to the world that I'm my career is not going great and I'm financially struggling. Um, and the third one was if I drive somebody who recognizes me from something I've done. And uh, I finally got the car registered on Uber and uh, I didn't activate the app for a couple of days. I was kind of psyching myself up for it. And then it was getting towards the evening, uh, late afternoon one day, turned the app on a couple of minutes later. But being I got my very first ride, the car was decked out, vacuumed, sick bags, everything else that you kind of read that you need to be a good Uber driver to get five stars. And it was a guy called Matt. And uh, I drove around to the address, parked up, waited for five minutes. Uh, five minutes, he didn't come out, so I called him. The guy has a very distinct voice. Um, and I said, I'm your Uber driver. And he went, oh, they do this all the time. You gotta go one block over and round to the back. And I was like, is this Matt? I won't say his full name. And he was like, yeah, who's this? I was like, fuck dude, I'm coming over. So it was a guy that I'd known, him and his husband were both publicists. Right. And I'd known them for four or five years, gone for dinner over their house, hung out a ton of times. So I drove over to his house and he comes up and he's like, what are you doing driving Uber? I was like, I'm broke. I, 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 I need to earn. And he was like, oh, I feel weird getting in your car and paying. I was like, well, you're not getting a free ride. So I <laughs> get in or cancel the ride. Right. So he jumped in the car. We're driving off. I said, where are we going? He said, we're going to the Beverly Hilton. Drove to the Beverly Hilton. I'm chatting to him. He's asking what's going on. So for the first time, I've got to admit to another person, my career's not going great. I'm struggling financially. This is kind of where it is. And owning it and voicing it, instead of crumbling me, suddenly kind of straightened my back. I felt like I'm owning my, taking responsibility from where I'm at. I'd made some poor choices and various different things. And we arrived at the Beverly Hilton. And he was picking up a client, beautiful actress, who was doing a press junket there. So we arrive at the Beverly Hilton and uh, she's uh, against this backdrop wall with photo photographers all taking pictures of her. She's doing all the, the poses and everything else like this, looking as glamorous and wonderful as she is. And he said, oh, we're just picking the client up and we're, we're going off to another address. So she comes up, she gets in the back of the car, he's in the front. I knew of the actress, I uh, had seen her. And so she gets in, she's like, hi, oh, what are you doing in the front? She said to Matt, and I said, I'm just hanging out with my buddy, Neil. And she went, oh, okay. So we started driving off and we're chatting. She went, oh, you guys are actually friends. And he was like, yeah, Neil's a really successful actor. He's a good buddy of mine. And I looked in the rear view and I could see her kind of go, yeah, clearly that's successful. He's driving my Uber. So ego ding three times. Everything you wish yeah. that didn't happen, happened. I know, right? And it was yeah. just, it was so fortuitous, but it felt initially like I wished the world, you know, the hole would open and swallow me up. I said, where are we going to? And she said, oh, we're going up to Seth MacFarlane's house for a party. And I was like, okay. And we carried on driving. She went, actually, hang on a second. Let me call Seth, because I can get you uh, um, on the door. You be, I can get you a plus one. Do you want to come to the party? And I was like, actually, guys, I need to make a little bit of money. So uh, I'm going to carry on riding. And they went, okay, next time, no worries. I dropped them off at Seth MacFarlane's house and went off having made my $22 or whatever it was and felt amazing. You know, for the first time in a year, I'd earned my own money and I'd earned for doing the hard work and doing the, not the Uber's hard work, but you know what I mean? For doing work, okay. I got paid for that work and all my fears were taken care of. Yep. You know, my ego fears uh, it were all taken care of in one ride. And then I loved Uber. I, I loved driving Uber. I, I met people who'd recognize me on shows and they're like, hey, you look like the guy that was in. I was like, I am that guy. I'm like, what are you doing driving Uber? I was like, I'm out of work. What do I do, sit on my ass or make a little bit of money? And they're like, oh, I respect that. I was like, thank you very much. And suddenly I felt this sort of internal confidence coming from being humbled. Yeah. And I'm so grateful that that humbling happened because then thankfully I booked a TV show then booked another series that was in Bulgaria and 
then it seemed like my career was back on track. And then after that, I didn't stop working for three years, which was amazing right up until the pandemic. Um, but the work changed for me after that. Being humbled and being kicked in the dick a little bit by life suddenly made me go, well, one, what kind of person do I want to be? Yep. I don't want that ego that was saying I was, I'm better than this and I'm too good for this. I don't want him to ever rear his head again because that's not attractive to me. Uh, as, as a person, they're probably not attractive outwardly either. And what's the kind of art, what's the kind of message that I want to make? And my art, my acting, my writing, um, I directed a couple of short films then in that time because I knew I wanted to be a director. And each one became, for the first time really in my career, a true expression of the voice that I wanted to give out. But I needed to be squashed. And I'm so grateful at 40, I had that experience that squashed me i've been squashed a few times i will say like you say I, i've had a you know i've had the carpet pulled from underneath or the rug pulled from underneath my feet a few times and left without anything i always say i has i was playing musical chairs and when i looked around i was out of chairs oh yeah and yeah it's when you get humbled truly get humbled you learn a lot about yourself you learn a lot about what's important to you and what's not important and i'll i'll you know, I mentioned the whole man of the year crap earlier. Mm -hmm. I don't hold that as a high standard to myself. Back then, my ego, like you said, I was like, that was man of the year. What do you got? You know, yeah. when I went to Miami or even LA, no one gave a shit who, about who you were, what you did, or about that. When I was in Miami trying to earn a living doing, I was with Elite Models and Wilhelmina. Mm -hmm. I literally, because once you get a job, you might not get paid for six weeks. And then you're constantly on castings and you, if you're going to constant castings, you don't have time to go to a regular job. So I had to find a job, which is hard to find in Miami, being a, not a foreigner, but foreign to Miami. And I met one of the four owners of the improv comedy club. And I literally jokingly did the splits in my dress pants in front of her at the, uh, her name was Renee Oh, Renee Reinhardt or something like that. Anyway, we're in the Miami improv and I did the splits joking with her and she says, okay, you need to get a job. What do you do? Can you, can you do this? Can you do that? I was like, I can't do comedy. You know, I love the fact that you do the splits and her first thing is you need to get a job. Was she, was she it was like, you have skills, so we need to get you a job or dude, you need a job. If you're doing splits outside comedy clubs, she was well we were actually having dinner is what it was i had oh, okay. i had sent her an application and it went to her spam file and she found me at a moment when i needed it the most like i was penniless like you mm. at that point i had one of my girlfriends a friend of a still a good friend of mine here in louisville she sent me what she had in her purse in an envelope that very second it came mm. in the mail like two days later like, i remember it was like 50 or 60 some odd dollars and it had some change in it too Mm -hmm. I think how bad she felt for me. I, I'll never forget that. It's like, who, who am I to take this money, you know? And then, mm -hmm. but then I got that job with uh, the improv. I was doing group sales. And, but uh, I was making, I think at the time, shit, $12 an hour. This is back in 2007, just mm -hmm. so I could continue to do that and do castings and all that whatnot. So it's, it's weird how little things happen where you feel like you're a success or what you consider success then all of a sudden you are at the bottom of the barrel again. You're like, what the hell did I do? And I think it's, it's, the, hardest, it's the hardest thing, dude. I mean, it's, it's the hardest thing that I've reconciled with. And I'm so glad that I've reconciled with it. I, when I, I decided to become an actor at 23, there was one path for me. There was, there was, there was no doubt in my mind that this path was the only path and it was the way I was going to be. And I was going to become an A-list actor. Um, I was going to be the guy that I was physical. I was going to be the guy that's been in these action movies and everything else like that. And the first three years of my career, nay, four years of my career really supported that. I, I was doing ever increasing work. My first feature film was with Oliver Stone, uh, doing um, Alexander with these amazing actors and traveling around the world. I then went to premieres in London and Los Angeles, was courted by agents in Los Angeles, moved to Los Angeles. From there, I got a couple of gigs that were all moving up the ladder and the, and the strata. And my focus was always on, I'm going to be that dude. Yeah. And uh, then about five years, six years into my career, 
um, two or th three or four years into, yeah, probably seven years into my career, three years into living in Los Angeles, three or four years into living in Los Angeles, things kind of plateaued. And the acceleration of my career wasn't happening at the same speed. And I felt like the place that I wanted to go was getting further and further away. And I struggled to reconcile that gap. The gap between where I was and where I believed in my heart I should be was so vast, I did not know how to get there anymore. I didn't know the steps to make because it felt like I was um, stagnating where I was. And I started having breakdowns. I've never had a breakdown before in my life. And this is a decade, 11 years ago or so, yeah, around the time the Sakura Brothers thing. Uh, and I started having breakdowns, had my first panic attack in, uh, in, in, in my life and didn't know what that was. And then they started coming once a week. Then they started coming a few times a week. Then it was once a day. Then it was a couple of times a day. And I got to this point and I was just like, I'm, I'm in trouble and I don't know why and I don't know how to ask for help. Because to ask for help is to both admit to myself and to somebody else that I'm failing because that was all it was. I felt like a failure. I felt yeah. like I had failed as an actor. And that was the only thing that I'd set my sights on. And I had my family and friends back in the UK who were sending me notes going, hey, I just heard you in this, or I just saw you in this, we're so proud of you. But inside that felt like failure because the level that I was at was leagues away from the level I wanted to be at. And I couldn't reconcile it. And it took a long while for me to understand that success, at least the way I now metabolize it, has to be an internal thing. Yeah. The external validation is lovely. It's nice for people to say you did a good job. We really like you. And for that to be physicalized in terms of work is the greatest compliment. When I've been offered gigs um, that I haven't had to audition for, somebody saying, no, we really want you for this. That's the, the biggest compliment I can ask for. But chasing that external validation gave me really, it, it really damaged my mental health. Yeah. And learning to find enthusiasm, gratitude, and fulfillment internally from what I was doing had been that journey over the last eight, 10 years, and really in the last like four or five, each five years since the Uber thing of being humbled fully and then going, okay, well, what? there's a chance I'll never work again. You know, I, I'm 20 years deep into this and I don't have an acting gig on the, on the cards at the moment. I may never get another acting job. It, it, it's one of the realities of, of this, this life. I believe that that's not the case. And based upon the history and my credits, somebody will employ me at some point. I don't know what it will be in what, for what, and for how much money, but I believe that there's something but chasing that something has caused me a lot of emotional pain. And so finding the internal fulfillment of feeling satisfied that the job that I'm doing and the job that I've done is enough in and of itself yeah. has been a really hard fight for me. And I feel like for the first time in my life, I'm there. I feel like for the first time in my life, I'm not chasing that external validation. I'm not chasing that that which is why leaving Los Angeles is so important to me because it's all about chasing that. Everything is, is about chasing that. It's about, it's, it, it's you know, from friends to agents, to managers, to colleagues, everybody is kind of like, what's next? What's next? What are you doing next? What are you doing next? And for me, it was like, well, I don't know. And that would first the fear. And that would also make me feel like I'm atrophying. And if I'm not hustling, then I'm failing. And all of these negative like support um, ideals were being sort of fed to me. Um, but instead kind of getting out and going, it's actually quite nice just to sit with my puppy. Who's a lovely little nap just there. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I saw yeah, you reading a poem to him on, on your YouTube. Say again? I saw you singing or reading a poem to him that you wrote on your YouTube. Oh yeah, on National Poetry Day last year. Yes, that was yeah. really good. Oh, thank you, mate. Um, but yeah, it's just like, and, and expressing that. I mean, it's like, for the longest time, I was so scared to express my fears because it made my fears real. My fear of failure, if I expressed that I was failing, it made that fear real. So I pushed everything down. I just sold it on like a good fighter. And now on the opposite of that, I did, you know, I'm almost too much disclosure. 
It's kind of like, I. have you ever seen the emotional wheel? Have you ever seen that diagram of an emotional wheel? Yes, I know wheel? what you mean, yeah. Yeah, it's great. There's, there's three wheels on it. And in the center, there's six emotions. And then the sort of primary emotions, fear, um, anger, um, happiness, etc. And then outside of that, there's maybe three or four further expressions of anger. And outside of that, there's maybe eight to 10 further expressions of anger. For the longest time, I existed in the center of the center wheel. Wow. Like everything was either anger or happiness. Right. I didn't really know any nuances around the emotions. It was anger or happiness because I'd spent so long suppressing, repressing, and in fight or flight as a fighter, it's kind of like you bury everything down and just carry on. And now I've learned, I wouldn't say I'm at the outer wheel, but now I've learned that there are more expressions than just these two binary things. I want to express it as much as possible and share to the world, not because I need the other people to validate me, but because I want, I want to say to the world, if I'm feeling it, I'm scared. Yeah. I feel lonely. I, I, I feel depressed. I, I feel anxious. These feelings that felt so isolating and scary and um, feelings I felt like if I expressed, I would be ostracized for, or people would mock me for. That vulnerability was so scary to me that I didn't express any of it. And I walled myself up with all my armament. Now I'm like, I don't want that armament. I've spent so long trying to strip it away and having experiences that have stripped it away for me, that now I wanna just sit and just be as vulnerable as I can possibly be because that feels like the healthiest expression of who I am. And it's coming back to what we said at the start of like, I don't need to see the whole road. I just need to see what's in the headlights. By expressing my vulnerability, it's amazing the people that have come into my life who have expressed their vulnerability in echo of mine, right. in support of mine, inspired by mine. And then I'm inspired by them to express more and be open more. And suddenly I've gone from surrounding myself with people that make me feel safe because I don't have to express. Let me hang around with a whole load of other repressed people <laughs> who then will never challenge yeah. ourselves. Right. And now it's like, I don't want to be around somebody who's repressed. I want to be around somebody who's just like, Bring you this up. is me. I yeah. cried last night and I'm, I, I felt lonely this morning or whatever it happens to me. And all the positive emotions as well. I'm not, I'm not a maudling person, but it feels like that's what the world should be. And that's the message that I want to put out there, that emotional vulnerability is not only admirable, it's essential yeah. to existing. We, we as human beings, and I'm not saying anything anybody doesn't know, so we as human beings can only connect through vulnerability. You tell me something that tells me something about you as a human being that gives me the bravery to go, oh, it's safe enough to me to show this much of myself because you've shown that much. Yeah. Now, if you show a little bit more of who you are, I feel safe enough to show a little bit more of myself because we're all protected and we don't want to get hurt. Yeah. And that's the dance that I lived in for a long while. My mode now is, well, let me just, here's my cards. This is who I am. If it's too much for you, then okay, go with peace. But if it echoes an element of you that wants to show that vulnerability, then it's great. Let's just let's just fucking hang out and kind of eradicate all the shit that was getting in the way of that authenticity. Um, yeah, that to me is 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 the sort of, sort of the next of life now. You know, the more people see you talk about this, though, they're going to open. They're going to say, "Oh wow, he's gone through this." This actor who's been you know, like you said, we saw him in this movie and this show and whatnot, and he's gone through this kind of stuff. Like, holy shit. I mean, I've, I know what anxiety attack feels like. I've had one in traffic where I'm in the center lane at the red light. And for all of a sudden, I f I'm, I've always been claustrophobic. Then all of a sudden it just hits. I'm like, oh, like your heart. And you, you want to get the hell out of your car. Like, what, what if I, am I having a heart attack? Is, can I call someone? And then you start, you, it's, a, it's like a snowball effect. It gets worse and worse and worse. And I've woken up in cold sweats before having an anxiety attack. And so I know what you're talking about when you go through everything. And when you and I met during that photo shoot, I was actually going through a time at that point. I had no clue, but I was going through a change in my life and I was going through some panic attacks and I was going through a lot at that point. So I'm, you and I, I think we're, we're about three years apart. I'm 48. 
And my wife and I just adopted a baby girl at birth and she'll turn two in September. So I'm, I'm kind of on the older side to do this again. But I have to tell you, my friend, it has brought me to ground zero in the best way possible. Like I watch her grow up. How, it's like you watch this through her eyes. Everything's new. It's like dada, daddy. And then all these new words she comes up with and she wants to help me. Like I'd make my coffee. She knows what I'm doing. She says up, up. She wants to help her on the countertop. She wants to put my little peppermints in thing with me. Uh, nice. It's like all these little things that I just like you take for granted. Like yeah. you want to be successful and do all this. It's like when you see it in these little eyes, you're like, I don't really give a shit no more. It's like, it's about no, she, she doesn't give a shit either. That's, that's the beautiful yeah. thing. Like, yeah, I, I don't have kids, but I've got um, got kids and nieces and nephews and they're all back in Britain. Um, so I don't get to see them a great deal, especially this last year. But the gift that they give is that, especially when they're really young, there is no ego, not in the conventional sense that we think about it. They're not trying to hide how they feel. You know, they wear their feelings on their sleeve. Yeah. And anybody knows who has ever engaged in play with a four-year-old, a five-year-old, if you're not completely engaged in the illusion of play that you're playing, whether it be monsters and frost giants or whatever it happens to be, if you're not committed, then suddenly the illusion dissolves and they don't want to play it anymore. Yeah. If you're 100% in it and playing with them, the imagination just creates something even bigger. And... Children, children don't care if you are, you know, and you hear it all the time from people who are super successful. The Rock talks about the fact that his kid doesn't care that he was in this movie or that movie. She cares that he turns up and reads her bedtime story and is there for cuddles and oh, yeah. is, you know makes sure he puts a band aid on her boo boos and all this kind of stuff. That's all that matters. And shouldn't that be the only thing that matters anyway? It should. You know, the thing that matters should be our connection with other people. And the way that we express that connection. And it's a conversation. There'll be a Jamaican man uh, who's, who's talking to an Afro Caribbean woman. You know, it's, there's this melting pot. Right. And the idea that we're all traveling the same escalator, we're all getting on the same tube, is a literal metaphor for the way that everything is. We're all, we've all got these feelings. And it comes back to that thing of repressing the feelings and for fear of being attacked. Yeah, that was what it was for me is not even acknowledging that I had these feelings that scared me for fear of attack meant that I wasn't engaging in the human experience. How can I look, appreciate, understand and be compassionate towards another human being who might be going through something if I can't even recognize that I'm going through something myself? It's that's what compassion is. That's what empathy is. I burnt my hand when I put it on the stove. Therefore, if I see you put your hand on the stove, I'm going to feel that pain, even if it's just a sense memory. And now I feel bad for you because I know what that feels like. Right. And that's what the arts is. The arts is about driving an emotion in somebody that is a compassionate emotion. We watch a rom-com and we know what it feels like to want love. Hopefully, we know what it feels like to feel love and to feel in love and feel loved. So when we watch people struggling, we put ourselves in their position and we feel the emotions, if the storytelling is done correctly, yeah. we feel the emotions of these characters. So it makes us feel, we get the oxytocin release when they kiss yeah. because we know what that feels like to feel this thing. And so to have that level of compassion for somebody else that we can put ourselves in their shoes and to a degree understand what they're going through, that's what we're on this planet to do, to understand and experience each other and have that compassionate drive to make sure that we take care of each other in some way or another. So the idea that you can look at somebody else and not in any way, even for a fraction of a sense, acknowledge that they are going through a human experience just the same as you, makes no sense to me. Because to me, that's the whole purpose of being here, right? Right. And... I don't know how we fix it. I don't know what happens. Tribalism isn't the result. And I don't, obviously, we, I don't want to turn this into a political podcast. No, no, yeah. Tribalism isn't the result. We, we don't unify by becoming more sectarian. We, 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 don't, we, don't, we don't bond by becoming more divisive and separate. Um, so, and of course, we need to highlight groups and make sure that malign groups are getting the attention 
that has been long overdue so that we can redress the balance. But it's been an amazing two years for that with the women's movement, with the BLM, with, with the, the changes in understanding about sexuality, trans um, uh, communities, everything else like that. And obviously, I'm very grateful that the voices that are getting heard. Um, and I do believe, I'm an optimist and I'm, and I'm a humanist. I, I firmly believe that the pendulum is starting to swing in the correct direction. And I actually have a lot of optimism that the next few years, we're gonna see radical shifts within communities and with societies all around the world where we are more loving and accepting towards each other because it's the only direction we can go in. Yeah. I think eventually everything corrects itself. It just takes time. Yeah. They always say time heals. It, I think it does. I think so too. Yeah. Hey, let me ask you something. Would you ever consider, kind of off subject a little bit, would you ever consider doing an actor's workshop? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm interested. Look, yes is the answer. Yeah. Yes. It, it, it's, it's one of those things that I've never taught acting. And... Um, I wouldn't profess to be an acting professor or know, be able to tell somebody how to act. So I think my, my old acting teacher, Michael Armstrong, who I love to death, um, has a beautiful phrase. And he said, creativity is like a butterfly's wings. If you touch them, the butterfly will never fly. And so when a butterfly comes out of the cocoon, if you touch the butterfly's wings, the oils on your fingers will prevent the butterfly from ever taking flight. Wow. So you've got to be really careful with someone's creativity. Yeah. But you can't step on it too much because if you get too much of your oils on, for want of a better metaphor, you're going to prevent them finding their own flight and their own path. Right. But there is, I've learned a lot over my 20 years of doing this professionally and the two years that I studied it. And um, I do believe that there's something I've been through, which might help somebody nudge them in a direction. So yeah, I'll be open. Yeah, I mean, I've had several students, we've only done uh, two workshops so far. Tony Hudson has done both of them. I met her on Instagram, she flew in, we shot her photos and I asked her, the, this is back in October of last year. And I said, hey, would you ever be you know, interested in doing an actor's workshop? It's something we kind of brainstormed about. So she flew in again in December and we did December 6th. And COVID was pretty high and mighty going on. So we only had about eight students. So we right. did it again this uh, two weeks ago. We uh, had 16 students here. So it's just that alone and would be a fantastic experience for everyone to have you here and doing it. Because it's not, it's, yeah. Uh, well, we can talk about later also. Yeah. And, uh, but that would be fantastic if you could. It would bring yeah. a whole new audience in for you and for them to have a different teacher come in and just different students too. Yeah. It's not about, I don't think um, a little oil on their butterfly wings might be like armor all, cleans them up a little bit too. Yeah, <laughs> it's just the right amount. I mean, it's like, I remember writing the, the first feature, uh, the feature script that I wrote that uh, got produced 15 years ago, whatever it was. I remember I hit a sticking point. And so I sent it to him. Um, he would, Michael was a, a writer and director for years, we wrote and directed in excess of a dozen films. And I said, I'm, I'm finding a sticking point with this bit here. I don't know what to do with it. And he read it and he went, yeah, you're right. It, it, the, story's, the story's struggling. I said, well, what do I do? He said, go and hug a tree. And I was like, fuck, I don't need your Gandalf shit right now. I just, right. I just need, I, I, I need you to nudge me in the right direction. He was like, if I tell you what to do, you'll do it my way. And this is your story. This is your art. You need to find your way to do it. If you want to bounce ideas, I'll chat to you. He said, but if you're looking for me to tell you where to go, I can't do that. Go and hug a tree. And uh, that's, I love that. It frustrated me at the time, but I metaphorically hugged a tree. I, I kind of down tools. I went off somewhere. I spent a couple of days just meditating and doing yoga and hanging out and exercising. And suddenly my brain went, oh, if I just shift this, suddenly the dam unlocked and I'd moved the lodestone that let the water flow through and I found it. And it, I think it's so important with creativity. I think that I've experienced a lot of times in the film industry, everyone has an opinion, we know, we, we, we know that, and everybody believes their opinion is valid. And I'm not saying that opinion isn't valid. 
Um, but everybody wants to tell you what's wrong and what they would do to fix it. Actually, no, that's wrong. I, everyone wants to tell you what's wrong. Very few people know what to do to fix it. Yeah. You know, it's just like, we, we all do. We watch a movie and we're just like, man, that story was shit. We don't think about what you would need to do to nudge it in the direction in your mind to make it a better story. We just judge. Didn't like it. Actor was terrible. Whatever it happens to be. But finding a way of solving it is a really difficult thing to do. And that can only come from the artist. It can only come from exploring, expressing, trying, failing, trying again, failing, trying again, failing a ton more times till you eventually go, oh, this feels right. This is the way that I need to do it. And anybody who tells you how to do it, first of all, I think is a charlatan. And second of all, how hubristic to tell somebody that you know the way they should express themselves. There's technique, right. there's, there's craft, there are certain things that um, we all know. You know you, however you play your violin is how you play your violin, but there's a way you string it, there's a way you tune it, there's a way you practice bow technique, but the, you know, the, the, the music that you play is entirely up to you. And I think that that's the metaphor that I try to toe the line of whenever I give notes on stuff or whether I express, it's like, I'm not telling you how to play your music. I'm right. just saying that the third string was a little flat. So maybe just look at that. And that's, that's the skirting around trying to get too much oil on the wings. Right, right. Go you know? hug a tree, right? Yeah, right, exactly. Go hug I a tree. I love that metaphor. I have to remember that. Yeah. I do. I love that metaphor. It's like, well, what I do, what I do, you know, if I do this or that, what do you think I do? Go hug a tree. Yeah. <laughs> it's not my business to tell you how to do it, but yeah. But also it's, it's disempowering, right? If, if, if I tell you what I think you should do, first of all, that's just my opinion. Yeah. And second of all, I'm kind of robbing you of the ability of discovering it yourself. Now we all need help. We all need ways to get through and everything else like that. But when it comes to creativity, I do think that it has to be your own personal expression. Yeah. You know, like, like you've taken millions of photos over, over your, your decade of, of photography. Right. And I'm sure, and this is by no means this on you because I'm just reflecting on myself. I'm sure a vast majority of them, you wouldn't want to show. I agree. Yeah. They're not an expression of who you are in the right. same way that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of auditions that I would cringe at if I saw now of myself. And there are thousands and thousands of takes that never made it to the edit that I'm probably very glad never made it to the edit because I was exploring and experimenting and everything else like this. But that's the thing is feeling capable and feeling confident enough and also feeling enabled right. by the surroundings to be able to play and know that it's not a pass or fail. You know, to be able to go for, for you as an artist to just be like, let me take a bunch of these. Oh, they didn't work, but I learned something. In the same way for me to get on set and try a take that I'm not entirely sure if it's going to work. It might be too big. It might, you know, the, the colors might be off on it, but I want to try a take. And if that didn't work, then maybe I learned something that informs the next take. And it's one of the things I've been loving recently. I've got a producing partner called Russell Gray, who um, we've got a few projects which we're, we're about to hear news on. Um, which is very exciting. And the process that we do is I come up with an idea. I spitball the idea with him until it starts to take shape. Then I write a draft. Right. I write a draft of the, the, the pilot or the, or the feature film. And then I send it to him and we riff. And there is no idea or concept that's off the table. There's no such thing as a dumb idea. Every idea pressure tests and I firmly believe in pressure testing everything because if it holds under that pressure, you know it's stable. Right. If part of it cracks, you're like, oh, there was, a, there was an instability there that we need to shear up and find a better way to hold it. And then there's pressure test it again and pressure test it again. And the freedom to be able to play, because that's all play is, 
is an absolute freedom to let your creative mind just blah, riff without fear of judgment that, no, that's a dumb idea. That's not going to work. Neil's an idiot. Okay, let's move over to this person because then you're like, oh, I won't express myself next time. Uh, so it's so important to have that freedom to play. And if, if you try to box that creativity and that freedom into too con constrained a container, yeah. then it's never going to get the chance to flourish to become the thing that it is. And um, it's, a, it, it's a big thing that I've told a lot of actors um, when I was in LA that I, I, I'd spoken to. And I've done a lot of different junkets and people always say, you have one piece of advice you could give to an actor. It's if you love the thing that you want to do, do it as much as possible. Yeah. Do it as much as possible because we all know that to go from chopsticks to Chopin, there's only one way to get there. Keep and playing. that's, that's keep playing. Yeah. Keep playing and messing it up and hitting bum notes and keep playing and eventually you'll get there. Um, but you have to have the freedom to be able to make the mistakes and know that the mistakes are part of the evolution. And anybody who shuts you down for those mistakes, one is hubristic and wrong, and two is robbing you a little bit of the growth that you need to get to where you want to go. Dude, that's deep. It isn't deep stuff. It's deep stuff in a good way. <laughs> you know, if, I think you all put up to the universe if they ever make a... Um, obi-wan star wars you should play obi-wan they, yeah they're doing that right now with uh, they're doing the tv series with you mcgregor oh, they, oh they're using him for it yeah oh. they're, they're gonna do uh they're gonna do yeah he's, he's i think he's shooting it right now so oh, okay. uh okay did not know that somebody beat me to the punch and well, his name you mcgregor i think he gets to have that one some guy i've never heard of him right yeah some fella he's done a couple of things well, I mean, he did play Obi Wan in the in the movie, but yeah, I thought if they ever did like a spin off, how they did Rogue One, that'd be awesome if you play something like that. Oh, that'd be fun, man! I mean, I I always loved Alec Guinness. Alec Alec Guinness is not only is he an incredible actor, and very few people know his movies outside of playing Obi Wan in the original Star Wars. Bridge over the River Kwai and Bridge over the River Kwai, and then some of the earlier stuff. If you ever get to see some um, Ealing comedies, there's a studio in in southwest london uh, called ealing studios and over the course of the 40s 50s early 60s they produced a ton of movies and he's in a load of them they're all yeah they're all comedies um and they're just amazing and he's such a gifted actor and when he got brought on for star wars i've got two star wars stories one is when we got brought on for star wars and this is a widely known one he decided to take a profit participation um, because nobody knew what it was going to be. And um, his grandchildren's grandchildren have generational wealth now because of the decision that he made to not get paid up front, but take profit participation. Right. But um, a few years ago, I did a pilot with Joe Johnston, who um, is an amazing director. He did Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and a bunch of other movies, wow. all the way up to Captain, the first Captain America, first Avenger and some things. And... Uh, as I was going to uh, shoot this pilot with him, uh, I was looking up his IMDb and looking up on Wikipedia, I like to find out what I can. And there was a thing that said, he designed the Millennium Falcon. No way. And I was like, you mean to design it? So we're on set, it was, it was first or second day, I, I kind of got my feet, it was probably second day, I got my feet under me. And then we're waiting for the setup and I'm standing next to him. I said, I heard you designed the Millennium Falcon. And he went, yeah. I was like, can you tell me that story? Yeah. So over the course of a couple of hours, because we kept stopping to shoot, and the, the, the DP and the first AD were starting to get a bit tired of us because he loved telling the story and I loved hearing it. And he'd be like, guys, we need to shoot. Oh, yeah, yeah, but, 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 but we'll carry on. Um, he said that he was working, uh, and sorry, Joe, if I get some of the facts wrong, he was a student in Los Angeles and he was studying um, art design with relation to film, um, storytelling, model building, that kind of stuff. He was working on a feature film, uh, doing um, some storyboarding uh, that was an hour drive away. So after he finished his college work, he had a two hour drive there and back. And he arrived at school one day and saw a notice to, for a storyboard artist to come on board to work on a film, but it was only half an hour drive away. So he decided to go for that one. He showed up. And there was George Lucas and his production designer were in the room. He was the only person that showed up for the uh, interview. So he got the job and started doing storyboards. 
they designed all of the ships because they were in pre-production for Star Wars. They designed all of the ships, but the designs that they'd used were based upon squares. They were box shaped. Right, right. And Space 1999 came out while they're in pre-production and all of Space 1999's um, designs were box shapes. So suddenly they were like, shit, we've got to change our designs because it looks like we're now copying Space 1999, which was this big sci-fi film. And so they didn't have time to do it all. So they said, Joe, do you mind having a crack at Millennium Falcon? Your only remit is circles, the opposite of Space 1999. So he designed this circular thing with circles on top of it with all this kind of stuff and designed it. And they went, we love it. We're, we're looking for this ship called the Death Star. He designed the Death Star. Circle. Then he designed the X-Wing Circle. Then he designed the X-Wing Fighter and came up with the, the idea of being an X-Wing. They designed the TIE Fighter, which was the opposite. One is expression. The other is closed. Talk right. about metaphors for being open and vulnerable, X-Wing fighter, or closed and in the dark force. So he designed these things, again, a circle with a closure around it. He designed all these things, and he said, at the end of telling me all this story with all these details, I like, man, that's amazing. So do, do you get a little piece of the revenue now for the merchandise? And he said, no, before we went into production, I had to sell all of my designs to um, George Lucas for $1. No. So he sold them all, I was like, ah. Does, oh. that not, does that not bite a little bit when yeah. you know the amount of money he made? He said, no. He said, I was working on there. They paid me my wage. So I gave them the designs and it was for that for $1. And George kept him and, and, and put him onto Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. And then a um, few years later, he got a call and there was a guy that was supposed to direct, I don't know who it was, supposed to direct Honey, I Shrunk the Kids but he dropped out very close to production date. So like two weeks away from production, three weeks away from production. And the producer knew George Lucas and called him up and said, we're in a real bind. We need a director who can come on board who can handle this level of visual effects. Do you know anybody? And he said, yeah, Joe. So uh, Joe ended up getting his first directing gig doing Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, thanks to him. So he was like, he paid it forward he plenty. Yeah. But I love that. It's just that thing of show up, do your job, be humble, be nice, and you never know where the tendrils are gonna reach that that might work out in the future somehow. Um, that is an awesome humble. story. I'm, I'm a Star Wars nerd anyway. I'm a big Star Wars nerd. Yeah. <laughs> well, now you know another little piece of the puzzle. Oh, heck yeah. I, I can, hey, I'm Sam old enough to, I've seen it in the movie theater with 1977, yeah. I, was, I was a kid, but is yeah. it that or Gus the Kicking Mule? A nineteen dis or a Disney movie? Oh, I don't think that one came to the UK. I don't no, think I don't think I, you, I, it probably never made its way. <laughs> Dude, this has been. Thank you for taking your time for doing this. My today. pleasure, mate. Lovely chatting to you. It's nice to see you again. It's been, it, it's absolutely. been a wee while. What's that now? It's been a wee while since we've seen each other. It's been a wee while. Yes. Much. I um, but let's talk about the actors' workshop one time. I'd love to have you come in and do that. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Give me a shout uh, another time, uh, you know, off, off this, and, and we'll chat about it. I'd be well up for that. That'd be and um, yeah, yeah, let's talk about. It. And I like how this went different than just talking about movies and uh, yeah, roles that you played. It's like this is pretty deep, and I love that kind of stuff because people get to hear the real Neil, you know. The real Neil. It's true. The real deal Neil. <laughs> Is that your boxing name? Yeah, it should have been the real deal. It's just, yeah, we, we used to joke about that. If I had have turned pro, that would have been my boxing name. Real deal Neil. Neil, the real deal Jackson. You should have done that. You, you, you all teach boxing if you still keep it, keep the bag going. Oh, I still hit the bag, still do my bit. Yeah. I think there's nothing. I think people miss what they miss about just a regular fight. Fight is the simple jab. If you're left, if you're a righty, mm -hmm. the simple just how to hold your hand. You know, yeah. this one always answers the phone, but you keep it down low. Yeah. This one's out like this, but they, people always throw their elbow out and like haymakers. Like no, you just out, just you cool. stand out and, and just go. pop, pop, pop. And yeah. I taught fitness kickboxing in Miami, and okay. it was. I mean, I had to go to school for it at the Miami Fight Club. They actually had a, that's what it was called back. This is 2006, seven, something like that. And we went through a whole course on how to teach it, whatnot. And man, it kicked my ass to learn how to do it. Mm -hmm. Bloody my knuckles a few times. They want you to toughen mm -hmm. your knuckles up without punch, without gloves, just to have some tape on your hands and get your wrist strengthened up. And mm -hmm. 
I've never been more sore in my life. But then when you actually go in front of the little, uh, not judges, but the, the other coaches that teach you how to do it, then you got to explain to you, they want you to explain to your uh, clients, like the real world scenario of why you would punch this way and not this way. So it's not just fitness. It's about real world scenario. Like, okay, you want to keep your hand down. Like if they get too close, how you would kind of duck down and throw an elbow or throw a knee or, you know, how to do the proper uppercut and, and then do you just do the drill? So, I mean, all that stuff is so much fun. I love doing that kind of stuff. So I, and by the way, if you come here, I have a hundred pound punching bag. So. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. I got two sets of gloves. Nice. We can, the jab. we can work on it. We can, we can hone the jab a little bit. Heck yeah. Well, everyone can see the real deal, Neil. There we go. But anyway, okay. everybody, thanks, Neil. Thank you again for taking your time of your day, my friend. I really my do appreciate pleasure, it. pleasure, my friend. Lovely to see you. You too. And I will talk to you soon. And we'll yeah, talk we'll about the, uh, yeah, the actual workshop. Thanks, okay. Neil. That's a lot. Thank you.